once you're, you get to get into the state of heart failure, it's a progressive illness, and on average you have about five years to live. And in that time, you dwindle, that you, you gradually lose your energy, your, your ability to do self-care and to you can't carry your own groceries, you can't walk up the stairs, all those kinds of things. It, it, changes, it really changes your quality of life along the way. So the, the disease is deadlier than most forms of cancer, and along the way it just robs you of your ability to engage in life. So what we're hoping is that if we can take somebody like that, remuscularize the wall of their heart, we can prevent them from going into this downward spiral of heart failure and keep them so that they can live independently, that they can haul their own groceries in, that they can get down on the floor and wrestle with their grandchildren. That's sort of like real world tangible stuff that, that matters to quality of life. That's, that's the dream that I have for this therapy. For about the first month after transplantation, we have this uh, complication. You could think of it almost like a drug toxicity. And we call this engraftment arrhythmia, where the rhythm of the heart goes wonky and it starts to race too quickly, sometimes over 200 beats a minute. So this problem of engraftment arrhythmia has been uh, the major hurdle that we've been trying to overcome en route to clinical trials. We either needed to shut things down that shouldn't be there or turn things on that should. So we went through this systematically. Uh, initially, one by one, nothing worked. Then we did it in combinations, pairwise, nothing worked. And then we did it in triplicates, nothing worked. And it was only when we did a quadruplicate edit where we put four changes together, turned one on, shut three down, that we were actually able to make this engraftment arrhythmia go away. The cells that we were transplanting in had pacemaker activity. And what we decided was we wanted to stop their automatic pacemaking activity, but keep their electrical responsiveness so that when their neighbors fire, they could fire and contract and contribute to the, to the muscular squeeze of the heart. But they wouldn't be acting like pacemakers themselves. In normal heart muscle cells, if you look at video footage of them, they are beating in synchrony and they do this automatically. That's just doing their thing. And with these cells that we've done the gene editing on, they're very chill. They just, they just sit there. And if you add electrical stimulation to them, then they start to beat in synchrony once again. So they, they, they seem to behave just like we designed them to. What it means is that when we take this into patients, uh, we think we will have gotten rid of probably the biggest risk. If clinical work in developing new treatments is all about the risk to benefit ratio. You want low risk, high benefit. And so we think we will have preserved the benefit but will have dropped the risk down and that will be good medicine. We'll get to FDA approval at about the same time but we think with a much superior product.